Hi, this is Bob. Been working on a Heathkit HW104 and one of the problems that I encountered was that the VFO here had considerable drift. I got to checking this out and I found that it's basically the same circuit as was used in the uh, SB104. They used it in the HW104, the HW99 and the HW9. A similar circuit was also used in the HW101. You see a tube on top of the HW101 VFO. That's an amplifier. The actual VFO down inside is an FET transistor, which, which is similar circuit to this one, but not quite the same. But the thing I ran into on these, this is the circuit board from out of the uh, HW104. VFO. There's two boards in there the same size. They're sandwiched on either side of an aluminum mount and uh, in order to change the capacitors uh, this is what I started doing was the temperature compensation capacitors that were originally used in this uh, VFO. I don't know how they got onto it but they used 50 picofarad. This is one taken right out of it. 50 picofarad N150 capacitors. They had two of these in there and they had a 10 picofarad in parallel with it. So that gave you a total capacity of 110 picofarads. Uh, that's necessary so that the dial will calibrate. The more capacity that you put across the LC circuit in the form of capacitors, that takes away from your variable capacitor. What this does in effect is causes your band to spread out on the dial. If you, uh, if you reduce the capacity there, then the band comes back together closer. So that's how you line up the calibration points on the dial, is by increasing or decreasing that capacity. Now that, if you get the right capacity, you want about 110. Anywhere from 90 to 110 works fine, I have found then you can reduce and increase that capacity by adjusting the variable capacitor trimmers in here. So that gives you the fine tuning so that you can spread or spread the dial out or bring the dial in closer. Now to get the dial on the proper frequency then you adjust the VFO coil which is right down in this hole here. So I usually adjust these uh, VFOs on a frequency of 5.250. The reason I do that is because when you turn this capacitor to maximum capacity, that capacity that you're adding on the variable capacitor then takes away some of the temperature compensation of your temperature compensating capacitors. And when you turn it down in frequency to 5 megahertz, for example, then you're, uh, yeah, you're adding capacity that takes away from the capacitors. When you turn it up in frequency, you're reducing capacity of the variable capacitor. And then this incre increases the effectiveness of the temperature compensating capacitors. Well, one of the things I found was these N150s. At their 50 picofarad N150, there's two of them goes in here on the board, and those are too much temperature compensation. So I did a little research and got the checking on some of the earlier models. The SB104, for example, that was made before the HW104 and the HW99 and the HW9, used capacitors that were N75 temperature compensation. And they used uh, two 56 picofarads at N75 and that gave you a little more capacity. That gave you 112. Well, if you do that, your dial on the HW104 or your HW9 or your HW99 will not calibrate properly. So what is needed is 100 picofarads and you want the N75 capacitors for less temperature compensation. I have looked all over the place for these capacitors and I found a place on eBay that has them. 
if you go to eBay and you put in there let's see if I can get this on there so you can read it I've written it in pencil up there if you go to eBay and you type that in capacitor ceramic comma 33 picofarad comma 1 kV you will see these capacitors come up they are 33 picofarad N75 temperature compensation 5% they're RMC brand I don't know who makes RMC I thought it was Mallory but I'm not sure anyhow uh, I put three of those in to this VFO here and a 10 picofarad uh, NPO and the calibration was fine I got it calibrated nicely but it still had some drift but it was much better so I thought I'm gonna need a little more temperature compensation well I dug around in the junk box and I found a couple of these this is 10 picofarads N750 now N750 is a lot more temperature compensation but it's only 10 picofarads so that means it doesn't move very much so anyhow I put this in instead of the 10 picofarad NPO that they call for on there and by golly I got a really stable VFO now I also found out that uh, I did uh, two others of these and one of them I got a very very stable VFO when I put a 6 picofarad N470 that's this one right here in instead of the 10 picofarad that's where I put it was in that location where the 10 goes and that was very very stable on that one I did another one it drifted just a little bit after I got done with it and I put in two of these 10 picofarads N750 so it's not really a cut and dried thing that uh, just by replacing these three capacitors 33's at uh, these are three 33's in parallel to give you 100 picofarads is actually 99 picofarads 3 times 33 uh, now you will notice also that I took some bus bar and put in these little what I call rails here oh I can't even show it to you there because I got my hands I got this thing down so low I put these little rails in here like this on the circuit board and uh, just jumpered them across on each side and then I can take and I can tack solder uh, little capacitors across there and try them and the reason I did that is this board mounts in there vertically like this and there's another board on the other side like that so to change those capacitors you got to take these off of the mount you got four screws they're difficult to get in and out so I put those two what I call bus rails on there that's bus wire and then I was able to tack solder these capacitors on and test them without taking these boards out I still had to take the VFO apart and to take the VFO apart you got to take out all these screws those are all put in there for mechanical rigidity you notice you got them all of them here you got them here all around here there's one down here the coils mounted here with a half inch uh, nut you got all these screws here you got screws down here now this holds a bracket and this bracket goes to the back of the variable capacitor and I want to tell you that bracket has got a piece of what we call fish paper glued to it uh, fish paper is just a thin piece of cardboard but that is screwed to the back of the variable capacitor now that paper compresses over a period of time and those two screws on the back of the variable capacitor were loose on both of these VFOs that I recently took apart so if you uh, have one of these uh, you're going to have to take the uh, the VFO apart take the circuit boards loose and you can take those circuit boards out of there without too much trouble and then tighten those two screws on the back of the variable capacitor where that bracket is tighten them up real tight and I, I think it's been compressed so much after 30 some years I don't think it'll come loose again so I think that's okay now you also have to undo down in here there's a Jackson drive here and there's two little set screws on the quarter inch shaft for the variable capacitor you got to take those both and loosen them up and you can leave this assembly on here you can even leave the big round dial on here if you want to and you can then slide the capacitor and the VFO board out the back you have to take these out these out these out these out take all of them out this piece then pivots up and comes off and then you can take 
the uh, circuit board out from the inside after you got all the screws out and the shaft screws on this Jackson drive. Okay, so you get those guys all out and you put those rails in there like I showed you and you can take these capacitors. Now this is just temporarily tack soldered in there. I compare that to these SMD devices, D SMD devices and it's <laughs> I think they're in just as solid as the SMD devices are. But after you find out what capacity you really need by tacking them in like that, you can, you can heat them up again, pull them off, bend these around so you make a U-shaped piece, crimp it on there, and you can put them on real nice and solid. Uh, but leave the rails in there. They don't hurt a thing. They don't hurt a thing. Let's see what else I got in my notes here. Uh, okay. And another thing I wanted to mention now, the variable capacitor that's in there, I, uh, I always lubricate those on the ends of the shaft where the bearings are with a tiny drop of, uh, of oil. This is 10 white weight oil. It's actually 10W30 synthetic oil from uh, Wally World. And uh, I just put the tiniest drop on the bearings and a tiniest drop. There's two little brass wipers that make the ground connection for that uh, center shaft on the variable capacitor and I put a tiny drop on those too. Now the VFO capacitor in these is not really a linear capacitor. It it varies as you tune it. So your marks on your dial are not always going to align perfectly. I adjust them for, uh, let's see, the VFO goes from 5 to 5.5 megahertz. So I adjust them at uh, uh, 5.1 and calibrate that up when I'm setting up the VFO for testing here. I, I adjust it to 5.1 and then I turn it up until I get 5.4. I do that because the ends of the capacitor are the least linear and they are not uh, the, the calibration points don't mark up very good on there. But you want to put your big round dial on here then when you're doing that uh, so that you can line those up. You could put a little mark on here if you want to act as your uh, dial marker so that you can do that. And don't expect them to be absolutely perfect. That's why they put the crystal calibrator into the HW104 so that you can check those points uh, when you're using the rig and they've got a little button you can push so that you can uh, accommodate that and align your dial. Okay, uh, got these things covered. Yes, I think I've gone through just about everything that I have here. Now those uh, yeah, the VFO in the SB-104, when I worked in the service department at Heathkit, uh, the VFO was considered to be uh, calibrated properly and working good when it drifted less than 100 hertz in one hour. That's after a 15 to 20 minute warm up. So that's what I tr strive to get out of these. Uh, but I have, been, I, I have been playing with them, let's put it that way, and just working on them and working on them when I had time. Uh, this particular one here, I know I had it apart at least 24 times changing capacitors. And I got it to the point now where it drifted 15 hertz in one hour. So you can get these things really stable. And I like that because I can get on and I can talk to guys on the air for a half an hour or so. And I don't have to touch the dial. So that is really good. Really good. Uh, in, the, uh, in some of the rigs, like the HW104, you've got uh, regular little incandescent dial lights. These generate heat and they're mounted right up by the VFO. So I have replaced the, uh, the light bulbs in my HW104 with LEDs. It's, uh, now some of your regular LEDs are not bright enough. I took LEDs out of a regular LED 120 volt light bulb that went bad. <laughs> And I show, uh, I show how to do that on another YouTube video, how to take a regular old 60 watt LED light bulb apart and the LEDs you get out of there are fantastically bright. And I wired those in with a 1000 ohm resistor in series with each LED bulb and just soldered them onto the back of the light bulb sockets that were there with some stiff wire so I could bend them around and it lights up the dial just beautifully with one LED behind the meter 
one LED behind the dial. That's all I have on my HW104 and the heat from the incandescent bulbs is greatly reduced. Now that heat causes your temperature uh, to rise in the VFO and that causes drift. Okay. Now, when you're, when you're calibrating your dial, Remember that when you tighten up those trimmer capacitors on the side, you're increasing the capacity that is in parallel with the variable capacitor. And when you do that, you're, you're taking away uh, some of its, uh, oh golly, you're changing it so that it doesn't tune the same. And so you're, you're, when you add capacity, you're spreading your dial points out. It's on a circular dial, I know. Think of a, of a flat ruler type dial, and my fingers show you. You spread that out on your dial. And then when you, when you uh, unscrew these capacitors, you reduce capacity in parallel, and that means that you compress your dial. So that's how you calibrate the dial. And that's all in the, uh, that's all in the uh, manual, the operation manual for the HW104, which is listed on the internet. Okay, so I hope that helps you guys with uh, working on these VFOs. If you're working on an HW9, you do the same thing that I talked about. Uh, when you take that little tin uh, box off of the board that covers the VFO, a uh, good thing to do is to paint the inside of the box with flat black paint. That uh, reduces the heat conduction going to the parts inside the VFO. And that causes it to be a little more stable too. I've got my HW9 very, very stable using the same techniques that I showed you here. And, uh, and I've done two uh, HW104s here recently and an SB104 not too long ago. These can be very stable and a joy to use. And if they're not, if you have to keep tuning and tuning and tuning while you're talking to somebody and the guy's coming back to you saying, you're drifting, you're drifting, that gets to be annoying because it just doesn't work out good. These rigs are not uh, synthesized uh, like our modern rigs are. And uh, so uh, back in the old days, it wasn't too bad to have a VFO drifted a little bit. The other guy drifted too, so nobody said anything. That's just the way it was. But nowadays, you want to stay put. You want to stay in the right place. So you can do some things with your Heathkit HW104, SB104, HW9, HW99 to make these things a lot more stable. That's it, guys. Thank you very much. This is uh, Bob saying Heathkits forever. <laughs>